Hello listeners, Kathy Lawless, Life Story Curator, bringing you this podcast series, How Did I Get Here? A series of interviews designed for people just starting out in their careers, people in transition or possibly feeling stuck, and giving them access to the stories of people who have been there, done that, so that they might be inspired with some new ideas, or maybe just comforted knowing they are not alone, that everybody starts somewhere, and everyone goes through times of transition and times when they feel stuck. Today, I'm very excited to be interviewing Claire Yvonne Naisbit. Welcome, Claire. Well, Claire Yvonne. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. It's exciting to be here. And Claire Yvonne is an executive and life coach. And before we get into how did I get here, mm-hmm. I always like to start with my icebreaker questions. So, Claire Yvonne, if you could tell us, where did you grow up? Uh, how many siblings in your family? Where were you in the birth order? And kind of how you think how you grew up shaped you as a person? Awesome. Well, you can maybe tell from my accent. I, I have an English accent and I grew up in central England uh, with my brother and sister. I'm the eldest. Uh, my sister's two years younger than me and my brother is six years younger than me. And so I think it has made quite a, a significant difference as to how I am as a person due to my birth order, actually. Um, as the eldest, and I was always fortunate that I was pretty good at most things I turned my hand to, but my sister was so therefore in my shadow a bit. And I think that my mum spent a lot of time encouraging my sister and not so me, because I was okay. But I think therefore I tried really, really hard to, to get some attention because I was the eldest and I wasn't really getting it or needed it. The perception was I didn't need it. So I think it had a big difference. My brother, six years younger, he was always just the fun one. Still is, still is the cheeky one. And I still play the sensible, responsible, eldest and yeah, organizer. Um, yeah, definitely. So big role in my life, actually. Yeah. Well, I, I love that question. It's one I kind of stumbled on uh, as an icebreaker and another activity that I had done a while back in a leadership program. And I just find it so fascinating how the, um, the stereotypes of the birth order really play out. And you know, I, I get it, right? When you're the oldest, you're like forging new territory all the time. And uh, like you were saying, you know, your mom didn't think you needed any help, but maybe the next one did. So very interesting, very interesting. Yeah, so you said you um, were pretty good at whatever you did. Did you, were you into music or sports or art? What, what were your activities? Um, def- definitely sport, um, you know, lots of sport at school from hockey to tennis to netball, cross country running, always loved doing lots of active things. We sailed when we were younger as well and windsurfed, Um, less so on the creative side. In fact, when I was younger, I perceived I wasn't creative at all, hated English, couldn't spell. These are, this was my voice in my head saying, Claire, you're crap, you're rubbish at English. You can't spell. Actually, it's just not true. But at that point in time, I firmly believed I wasn't creative. I wasn't art, I was into art and actually just in this last year, I've now found my creative side. And, you know, at the age of 47, it's taken me that long. So, so you can shift yourself and your perceptions. But for many, many years, I thought I wasn't creative. And I didn't spend any time in that space. I did used to do music and sing. I used to love singing at school um, and played the piano. Um, and again, I haven't done that since school. And now I'm kind of curious about wanting to sing again. And I got myself a guitar in Mexico about two months ago to start learning a new instrument. So, you know, it's never too late to try something new and to sort of get rid of these old stories that we tell ourselves. Yeah, those stories can be so powerful. I remember having a story that I couldn't sing because I remember I was singing with my dad one time and he, he stopped and he's like, can you not hear yourself? You know, you're really at it, you know, and he kind of got on to uh, on me, and I was like, "Oh, well, then I'm like, I'm I'm out, right?" And uh, so it's funny how you know one little event like that can really shape you. And it wasn't until I don't even know when that I kind of found a little bit of voice, and now I'm known for my singing birthday songs to my friends wow. on their birthdays, you know, and belting yeah. it out. And of course, that is my only song now that I think about it. But <laughs> anyway, it is funny how those stories. I love that you're. Yeah you know, later in life going, you know what, how do I challenge that and do the interesting thing is, it's not always what we're told either, because it was again, going back to the sibling piece, my sister was told she was artistic, she could do art, I therefore ergo, Mm. Claire Yvonne or Claire as I was then can't do art. Whereas now I've started drawing and I really love it. It turns out I'm actually quite good at it. So it's not always 
I wasn't ever told you're not good, but I told myself I wasn't good. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. It can be self-imposed, just yeah. some thoughts that you have and yeah. Consciously. Yeah. Okay. So are you an introvert or an extrovert? I'm one of these middle people. I'm an introverted extrovert. I, I for years I thought was an extrovert and what I've discovered now is actually I love being on my own. I was very afraid of being on my own for, for decades and uh, shook that fear in the last two years. And now I really crave time on my own, but I love being with people too. So I need both. I, 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 I get energy from being with people and then I need to go and sort of hibernate. <laughs> and Recharge the energy. Okay. Well, I've heard a new term called the ambivert. And um, I think I'm that too. I'm in the middle. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I I can be very extroverted and need that energy. And other times I'm like, nope, got to recharge the battery. I and think there's more of us out there than we're, we give credit for. Um, yeah. Well, I had COVID. And, <laughs> and I think COVID and this whole experience really has uh, forced a lot of people to be more introverted or more, you know, you have to be by yourself and uh, and be okay with that. So. Yeah, it's amazing, actually. So we're all re our new perspectives on what we actually like, and it's great. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so on the fun meter, scale of one to five, one being couch potato and five being life of the party, where do you put yourself? <laughs> I think it's changed. I think when I was younger and at university, I think I would definitely have been given a five. Uh, now, um, I probably would say three. I was going to say four, but I actually think I'm a three. I much prefer, I like to say, I'll happily read a book on my own on an evening rather than be going out. So uh, definitely, I'm just happier with myself than I used to be, which is great. So I'm more, more, more self-esteem, don't need external validation as much now. So I can, I can just be, and that's joyful in itself. Ah, that could be the, your own life of the party, <laughs> a party of fun. <laughs> She need somebody else to make me feel joy anymore. I can, I find it inside. Yeah. <laughs> okay. On the risk meter, same scale, one, five, one being low, hot, five being high risk taker. Where do you put yourself? Gosh, uh, it's a good, great question. Um, I think sports wise, people would say quite high four or five. I mean, I, I'm a skier and I've done, I went on a dog sledding expedition across Arctic Norway for six days with six dogs and my own tent and everything with a, with a leader where there's like six or seven of us, but that's quite hairy when I look back and think about it. It was only like five years ago. Um, wow. And that I can be quite risk averse suddenly in a business world when I was working in the oil and gas industry I was super cautious because you know lives were at risk with that work so mm -hmm. you know we were always looking at the technical data and analyzing risk and deliberately choosing to be be cautious because if we made a mistake with our technical predictions then someone's life could be, be at risk so yeah so I can do both um I'm very I'm one of these people who senses things when others don't sense things so if we're out walking in the hills I might be like oh that weather's looking a bit dodgy over there that lightning's getting a bit close can we go down whereas someone else like, oh it's fine so I, I I can do both if that, that so say three then in the middle <laughs> <laughs> we'll put you in the middle okay I get it well and I, I really enjoy those two questions because hearing your answers and then we get to hear your story and how it plays out in your life and so I think those two things really kind of uh you know I, I, share your personality and yeah I'm, I'm just thinking I've just spent seven months traveling around the world during COVID which therefore I think is probably perceived as quite risk a risky activity but I, I don't see it like that so I don't think of it, but I can see how it can be perceived as that so I'm, I'm a risk taker in that sense and I trusting in yeah yeah <laughs> Interesting. There's always the internal view of risk and then there's the external view, right? Of how other people might see the things and go, oh, well, that was risky. Uh, okay. So Claire, Yvonne, tell us oh, what it means uh, to be a, an executive and life coach, what you're doing today. And then we'll get into how did I get here? Wonderful. So essentially I work with individuals that are passionate and driven and successful already, but senses they're either stuck or senses something more in their life that they want so I work with them to help find a way forward to to live a more fulfilling and happy and successful life in a way of feeling content and so that can be in leadership it might be that maybe you're wanting a promotion at work and, and or to change or shift your leadership style 
or it might be that you're actually wanting to have a change in career so transition and you or it might be that a transition in relationship as well so it's really around where are you now and where do you want to get to and helping people understand that and so you know as a coach most I always laugh because all junior football teams have coaches, yeah, but very few individuals and business teams have coaches, yet we're all expected to work at our highest performance and a coach can really help do that. So I, I say it's how can you get the best out of life or yourself or your team at work and your leaders with a coach because ultimately we can see things externally that the individuals can't and I, I love it. I love it bringing this insight and pulling people out and showing them the way and being enthusiastic and sort of shining a light really and going, look, and, and holding a place where they can get to. And it's so amazing when they do. It, it's just completely wonderful. So, um, yeah, it's where are you now and where do you want to get to? Wow. I, I really, being in a form, you know, an athlete as well, myself as a young person growing up and as an adult, staying in sports and being active, totally get that. You know, we have all this coaching and you look at feedback and you watch video and you, you know, you train, you do all these things. And then you, in the workplace though, you don't do any of that. You just show up and you're expected to be great (laughs) and you're expected to be at your top every day, all the time. And there's no real performance on and then downtime and training. It's just all on, you know? So yeah. And we're not trained at school, how to deal with stress, tension, Mm -hmm. complications, competition. We're not, we're not taught. So I've done a lot of training myself to be a coach. I'm a certified coach. And so I've got lots of tools, simple tools, and there's nothing complicated that can really shift how one feels. And it, because we were, we just haven't been taught it at school. Yeah. Well, you listeners, know. you're going to be in for a treat. So if you're in transition now or feeling stuck, this is exactly who, who you need to be <laughs> hearing from. <laughs> okay, so Claire Yvonne, what uh, did you always want to be an executive coach? Let, you know, let's go back to that junior high, high school. Uh, what did you want to be when you grew up? Oh, well, I, when I was at high school, I had no idea what I wanted to be at all. I really had no idea. And I certainly didn't know I wanted to be a coach. I didn't know I wanted to be a geologist, which I did for 20 years before becoming a coach. I basically picked, I was a uh, jack of all trades, master of none. So I was pretty good at most subjects, but not particularly amazing at any of them. And so I picked subjects at school that I enjoyed and that was quite good. at. And then I took the same philosophy for when I went to university. I, I didn't, wasn't really given any useful advice. So I studied, jog- I went to, I was fortunate. I did pick though, this is really important. I went to four different cities in the UK to decide where to go to university. And I fell in love with the city of Edinburgh in Scotland straight away. My heart just expanded and it was like, I want to live here. I was like, I don't care what the department's like. I'm just going to come. So followed my body's instinct was like, this is amazing. And so I went to Edinburgh to study geography. Fortunately, in Scotland, you can have subsidiary subjects. So I did geography, geology and biology, loved geology. So gradually through the years transitioned into coming away with a geology degree. And that then, uh, and then, and so I did geology because I loved geology. Again, my heart said I was passionate about it. I was, I, I was, it, I was curious about it. I worked hard at it because I loved it. So the lesson here is really pick what you love doing, not what you're told to do. Yeah. And, and then even when I left university, I didn't know what I wanted to do at all. <laughs> I so even didn't know. What was your degree in then? Was it a geology degree? Yeah, yeah, it was a geology, uh, uh, um, BSc, a Bachelor of Science in Geology. I still didn't know what I wanted to do. So basically I had a year um, or two years. Actually, I went and taught windsurfing in Greece for four months. Uh, Then I lived in England with my boyfriend. I met there for a year and basically waitressed and worked at Abbey Life Assurance doing admin to earn money. And then I went traveling to, because I still didn't know what I wanted to do. And I went to New Zealand and then Australia and Thailand. And then when I was in Australia, in Perth, I'd run out of money. And um, I, I'd only, I only got like some like 2,000 pounds when I set off to go around the world on a ticket. I had no, hardly any money at all. <laughs> yeah. 
and this wasn't a problem um, back then for me. <laughs> and I'm in Perth in Western Australia trying to get a job in the gold mining industry. But there was no job. So I happened to put my CV into what was then mobile offices and they needed a technical assistant and I had a geology degree. So, so an oil and gas company. And I went, remember clearly walking into the office. It was like on the 10th floor and seeing geological maps and cross sections suddenly going, oh, this is cool. And suddenly the light bulbs came on and the energy, my physical energy came up and like, this is, this is what I want to do. So again, it was following the heart signal. So I worked there for a couple of months to get some money. And then I decided, or chatted with a the geologist there. And I said, how do I get a job in, as a geologist at Mobile? And they were like, you need to do a master's degree. I'm like, oh, I have to go back to university. Oh no. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I thought about it for a little bit, emailed the uh, an, a department, a geology department in Scotland, back in Scotland, in Aberdeen actually, and I said, could I get a place on your petroleum geology, specifically oil and gas geology course? And could I get funding? And I got an email back the next day going, because I got a first class honours degree from Edinburgh because I was so scared of failing, which is an, the inner voice had me that I was going to fail. Oh. So I worked and worked and worked and ended up getting the top grade I could get a first class honours. So when I emailed them and said, can I have a place on your master's course? They said, Yes to both. Yes to money. Yes to a place. When would you like to start? This September or next? <laughs> wow. Like, oh, OK. Someone's going to pay me to go and study for a year. So again, the uh, I was awake, alive, determined and a spark had been lit. So I basically changed my return flight and flew back to the UK and then to start the master's course in Aberdeen a, a month later. Wow. So you say awake, alive, and then now you have a direction and a plan. I mean, you can just see that you, uh, now you can see it, right? Whereas before you couldn't see it, even though you had the degree and you did well, you still didn't know how it all applied to the world and how you could make a difference. No. And it was taking that time out, giving myself permission to have time out, have some adventures, take some risks, meet new people. And suddenly the doors I happened to be in a building that had mobile in it. It wasn't where I was. I was like, oh, well, I'll just have my CV in there. And they happen, you know, again, things start to happen when you follow your heart and your body and your energy doors open. And that's that's definitely what happened. And so I studied for a year in Scotland, in Aberdeen. Um, and four months into that, I got a job offer from BP. I was the only only student on the course out of 24 of us to get a job offer that year because the oil price was eight dollars a barrel there was only two geologists employed in bp in the uk that year and i got one of those two geology jobs i was on a mission <laughs> yeah well and you're um, still in school and they offered you the job yeah so you hadn't even finished the master's degree and they were coming to you wow yeah yeah because of the the undergraduate degree and then how it they, there was the graduate interview scheme is still incredibly difficult to get into BP now, and it, and it was difficult then. Um, and I was sponsored by Stato, which is was is now called Equinor, but it was the Norwegian state oil company. So I then got to spend three months in Norway doing my project for my master's course, which was lots of fun. So Wow. So things really started rocking and rolling for you once you kind of got that energy and said, this yeah. is what I'm going to do, and you made the call. And wow, very cool. Yeah, absolutely. And so I entered, started working at BP, British Petroleum, uh, back in uh, 1999 is when I started there and did 20 years at BP. Uh, so, I, so I didn't really know about coaching until, do, 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 when was that, 2017. I got my first coach and then I was like, oh. And then, the, oh, this is, oh, this is interesting. And again, the doors started opening and my energy started increasing and I followed the footsteps towards coaching and then, and now working as a coach. As a and coach, actually, yeah. Yeah. So. so tell us a little bit about that 20 years and what that was like. I mean, it, it sounds like you, you know, you started in a certain path and then, I mean, did you get into management or leadership? Were you, um, in a certain discipline or how, how does that work in the oil and gas field? I guess yeah. I don't know a lot about so that. So I was employed initially as a geologist, working as a geologist for many years, actually, probably did oh, eight and nine years, 10 years as a geologist in different teams, different oil and gas. I worked, had a year in Houston, actually lived in Houston for a year. 
um, which was which was fantastic. Basically planning and drilling oil wells mostly. That was most of the work that I was doing and also describing the rocks underneath the North Sea, trying to find new places to drill wells. Uh, it was hard technical work. You know, it's, it's working with engineers, um, managing risks, planning wells, drilling wells. So very technical, technical work. Not really people orientated at all scientist and and mm -hmm. then um i got an i then we moved to norway back in 2011 and i got an opportunity to stand in as a team leader um and i loved it so i that was kind of my first team leader role and i and i loved having a team i, I loved us working together to solve all these really technical complex problems uh, i loved the responsibility and the accountability um, you know, and it's a lot of money. I mean, these oil wells can be up to a hundred million dollars per well to drill, and we were drilling them back to back, we're drilling twenty four seven. So it's quite exciting, but quite stressful as well. Um, and then I ended up coming back to the UK because uh, my expat post was up in in Norway. I was there for three and a half years, and the the strain was talking starting to take its toll on my body. I was getting headaches and migraines, and my back had been a a mess for quite a long time actually uh, physically uh, wasn't in a great state and um, yeah I was starting to struggle as a scene as a technical lead a team leader um, I wasn't getting the promotion to senior level leader that the role description said I should be if you know what I mean the role was a level F role but I was only a level G ah. and they weren't promoting me and that put stress into the system so I wasn't particularly happy um, at that point and starting to feel realize how different I was being told things like Claire you're too sensitive you need to be more resilient you need to focus more on the the numbers not on the people and that wasn't me I mean I by this time was loving and getting in touch with my sensitivity and my empathy and my leadership skills and my team were a happy high performing team um, but I started to realize more and more I wasn't happy <laughs> <laughs> and I was full of stress and anxiety. I wasn't sleeping well. And like I said, my body was starting to fall apart. So my body had been giving me signals that this high performance rate, even to, you know, going back to when I was doing the masters, this drive, it was like almost out of a, you know, I was forcing myself forward, very high energy. And yeah, it kind of took its toll. And the performance BP is a very high, has a very high bar for its staff. To, to get in and then when you're there you're com you're essentially competing with everybody yeah it's, so it's, it's very sorry it's a very male dominated environment as well yeah that that's what I was going to ask I was going to say how many women were on your team or how many women did you work with and then also what kind of hours were you working I'm guessing you know when you say the drive and taking its toll on your body you know were you put, putting in quite a few hours a week and not having any downtime and um so um I, compared to the US, my hours weren't so bad. I mean, I know people can work crazy hours in the US, but I, you know, I was consistently, my alarm would be going off at 6 a.m. and I wouldn't be getting home till 6 p.m. And then we were covering evening activities and weekends. Now, I wasn't covering every evening and every weekend, but when I was the team leader, you kind of always got an ear out for what's going yeah. on and awareness. I would be on call specifically maybe one weekend and three or one weekend and four. But I wasn't sleeping so well. So that was what was building up. A lot of it was me and the way I dealt. I didn't really know how to deal with the stress and the anxiety at the time. I had, Like I said, I hadn't been trained how to deal with it. And I, I wasn't dealing with it very well. Others can and do. It's amazing. Very impressed with them. Um, so that that was that was a bit of a, a challenge. So I, and So I did work weekends, but again, not that often. We didn't end up in the office that often unless things went a little bit pear-shaped as we would say. So um, it was sometimes we had to go into the office. Or I remember there was an Easter in, when I was in Norway. We were, we were all in for like four days replanning a well because the well had got stuck. We couldn't go any further and we had to, you know, and these are billion, well, not billion, but million dollar decisions we're making. Yeah. Well, and if you've got a crew on site drilling already, right, and something happens, then you're still kind of paying them right so the Absolutely. money's flowing right but oil's not flowing <laughs> yeah exactly the they're all going the wrong way the wrong way yeah and you're spending more money as well because you've got to redrill what you've drilled and yeah so now did you were you like out in the field and in an office or were you primarily one or the other 
I was mostly in the office. I did go offshore a couple of times, uh, a handful of times in my career, but mostly based in the office, uh, which for, to me was fine. I, again, the offshore environment, some people love, but I could, didn't really get on that well. Just even getting on, getting on the helicopter sounds exciting. It's not really. Um, <laughs> It's quite stressful. You know, you're in a survival suit. You've got a, a big life jacket on. The suit's too big for you. Uh, you can't go. It's not like you can nip to the toilet. You're sat in this seat with a really loud chopper above you for it can be three hours as you're flying out there. And, and whether we like it or not, unfortunately, some helicopters don't. Oh, the, the, the accident rate is quite high. So there's this anxiety just getting there. And then when you're there, it's like being in a it's like being on a ship basically it's all big heavy doors you can't go outside unless you've got all your personal protective equipment on so you've got helmets plastic goggles gloves steel cap boots your full coveralls on you know because it's a dangerous environment that you're in it's oil there's hydrocarbons everywhere and there's trip you know you, you have to be on your guard the whole time or on point all the time and sounds, i found that quite stressful yeah i say it sounds exhausting <laughs> yeah the stress yeah, level of that thankfully i didn't have to do that too often <laughs> yeah so then mind. it sounds like you were at bp when the big accident happened in the gulf then um, i was working at bp when the, the macondo gulf of mexico incident happened yes and which was you know i think it was 10 people died and you know the the environmental impact was huge and uh, i mean the company nearly went under i mean i think there was one day where we it nearly did completely go under but it didn't and so a lot of people went gray overnight, not just overnight, but in the next six months uh, working. I, I stayed in, I was in Aberdeen um, and still, yet yeah, my team were planning wells like the well that had the incident in the Gulf of Mexico. So when I say I was accountable and risk averse, because we must never, ever, ever have had another Macondo happen. And my team were responsible for planning wells, just like the Macondo, well, different, different geology, different basin, but similar things can happen to any oil well you are drilling. Wow. Yeah, so that was a real, real reality check probably about the dangers, even though it sounds like you're already well aware of them, um, even more right I mean, there. Just, wow. just mentioning it makes my heart rate go up and my blood pressure so, you know that I can feel myself getting into sort of if you like a fight or flight response and get emotional about it because it was that visceral for us mm -hmm. wow well thank you for sharing that so so you reach this point in your career where you're you're starting to not feel well physically yeah. and then also you're not feeling good about your level and your you know so what what do you start to do then is this when you did you seek out a coach or did they kind of was it like the next logical step while we were getting all the leaders coaches or no I, I I did it all personally I because so a really good friend of mine from Edinburgh University actually uh we were out for a walk and she was she was she'd just done some coaching training and I was like oh I could do with some of that <laughs> <laughs> and she said well I'm, I don't want to coach you because we're too good of friends but she introduced me to a friend of hers who she'd just trained with and so this lady Sally became my first ever coach and it was amazing. It was a game changer. And I was then able to, after only two sessions with her, uh, able to have a conversation with my then boss and say, I'm due this promotion. It's been three and a half years. And I was able for the first time to say it clear, clear, clearly, coherently and without tears. And two months later, on the back of that conversation, my boss later told me I got the promotion in February, two months later. So coaching got me my senior level leader post and uh, the recognition, which was amazing. And it was again, six months after that, I was like, oh, I, asked, I was like, Sally, how, how do you get into this coaching? You know, I'm quite, I'm quite just slightly curious as much to learn something new. So I went off to London for a three day course, loved it, came back to the UK. Actually, then I flew over to your neck of the woods. I was over in Colorado and um, I was like, oh, maybe I should do a little bit more of this so when I got back from Colorado I was like okay and I signed up to do four more weekends of training and then through that I was like this I love again so the body spoke to me I felt alive I felt connected and excited for the first time in quite a number of years and so following that intuition I was like you know what I need to leave BP I, I can't do this anymore I need something different and this excites me so yeah so i gradually I, I decided i was going to leave didn't tell them because you know in the uk you have to give three months notice i know it's quite different in the us 
Um, so I didn't tell them I was planning on leaving. I got accredited and trained up or certified as a coach in the next six months. So I made sure I was qualified so that when I finally left in, uh, in the March of, or the April, two years ago, April 19, I was accredited. I had 11 clients. I was already, again, I did it in true Claire style, all headlong in, determined, passionate, driven, keep going at the same pace. I mean, God forbid I actually slow down, you know, boom, right out the gate, you know. Um, and so I, that was really exciting um, for about a year. And then I basically realized how exhausted I was. And that was last well, just after COVID hit, really, it was March, April last year, 2020, I was exhausted. And that was when I went, you know what, I need some time out. And so I, I gave myself permission to have a solbatical or a sabbatical from July. I was going to take three months off and I kind of had eight. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm just in the process of kind of building back my business. So I've been doing it for the last couple of months and I did a lot... So, yes, yeah, so I went traveling instead. Again, followed my heart, followed what my body needed. So I went off to Croatia, Montenegro, Albania, because I could with COVID. They were COVID countries I could travel in openly. And then I flew to Mexico to be somewhere. Again, I, my gut was telling me, don't go to Christmas, dark, cold in the UK. Go somewhere warm. So I went to Mexico. And <laughs> that was when we were chatting when I was over there. and. Yeah. Had, Three and a half months there in the end. I only went for, kind of went for two months and stayed for three and a half. And again, it's following the signs, um, the, the the signs in the body, the, the external clues that suddenly, it's like I heard Mexico about four or five times in about like three weeks. It's like, hang on a minute. There's something going on here. <laughs> so. Wow. Well, I, I love that. I remember when we met, you were in Mexico and I remember the view in the background while we were Zooming and there's this water and this you know, the, these flowing curtains, uh, you know, just kind of drifting behind you. And you just had this great smile. And I'm like, wow, she's, and I love you called it a soul sabbatical, you know, the, the, and because it was, you know, it was a sabbatical from kind of the world or from the working world. And, um, but it was really for your soul. So it just, wow. You, and so it sounds like, you know, what you did after college is now what you did now again, and really yeah. just that discovery, that discovery part. Just to sort of, my friend Shelley Paxton has written a book called Soul Batical, so I, I, oh. I, to give her credit for that, and actually I spoke with her last April when I'm going, what shall I do? She's like, take a year off. I can't take a year off, and then I ended up <laughs> taking nine months off. So to credit her for this, the Soul Batical, but it is, it's a, it's a searching for my soul, and that's what's happened, and I found who I am. And that's why I used to be called Claire and now I'm Claire Yvonne because I'm, I'm kind of bringing that now represents who I fully am, not just part of me, which was Claire, which is perhaps the more masculine driven side. The Yvonne side I see as my more feminine, open, receptive, creative side. So now I'm this balance of Claire and Yvonne and it's my middle name anyway. And Yvonne actually comes from yew tree, which is spiritual. So it's I see clarity around spirituality or clarity around connection clarity and creativity so it's been a journey that's for sure sounds like and you just your energy and your peace and the what you know how you represent yourself is just you know it's so calm and just and clear I, I get I get the clarity so so happy for you this is awesome so how did it feel when you so you got all your certifications you're ready to embark on you know on this coaching endeavor how did it feel then giving your notice to bp and i mean oh. was that like this big giant relief or was there a big fear or how how did that go oh, i was it was it was really daunting really scary it took a lot of courage to you know so society if you like culturally it's like you've got i've got this awesome job with this great salary and this great pension i mean why the hell would i jack all that in yeah, so it was a massive decision. I have this lovely metaphor with with another coach I was working with at the time. Like the staying at BP was like a big wide river. It was a bit dull. I knew where it went. It went to the sea, and it was just like okay, it's fine. Leaving was a bit like hanging a left, going down this little river, you know, and going over some rapids and finding some eddies and going through territory. I didn't know where it went, and there's amazing scenery and mountains, and then more drops and it's like ah exciting uh and new and I didn't really know where I was going and that's what I needed in my life 
then you know I needed to take that risk going back to mm. the risk and do something different I needed to be courageous and get off that big flat boring river that had a lot of stress and tension in it but I knew where it was going and hang a left and do something completely new with my life so it did take a lot of courage and when I did it I when it, it was fascinating because I was on my coaching journey I could tell my sensitivity was increasing and it was actually quite difficult to be in that environment with my sensitivity coming back and my intuition coming in because I was starting to feel things that I'd literally been hiding and burying for decades. Um, so it was quite challenging uh, being there, having decided I was going to leave. And then gradually after I'd handed my notice in, that it's sort of and handing things over and letting go. I mean, it still was quite stressful, though, because they were trying to decide who my predecessor, predecessor, is that the right word? Who was coming after me? Successor, successor. Not my predecessor. Yeah. Who my successor was going to be, and there was sort of stress in all of that. And in the end, it's like Claire, it's not your choice. It's like let go. Mm -hmm. It's okay. And the wide um, river is going to keep going, even with me being over here on this narrow, you know, stream or or, or, or raging river, maybe whatever it might have been. Yeah. <laughs> Mixed. Well, it, it is interesting. I mean, I remember I was in corporate for twenty years and um, navigated so many different. Uh, you know, downsizing efforts and different things. In fact, I was part of some of the projects that manage those. And that's what my last few jobs. And, you know, I'm just like, again, you, you have that feeling of this isn't what I want to be doing, but I have a job that's important. And, um, but, you know, I, in the end, I ended up getting, you know, offered a severance package. So it wasn't my decision. It was my decision to take the package or I could have accepted a different role, which was a bit of a, a title demotion, that kind of a thing. And I was like, eh. so I decided after, since I'd been with the company 20 years to take, take the package. So I'd love your river analogy. Cause that's exactly what I knew where that could go, what that would probably look like. So how do I step off? But um, I stepped off then with the severance package, which was really nice to have. Yeah. Um, but then I was in that point of, I don't know what I want to do now. And do I go get another job that's on the big river um, or do I do something else? So it was, um, it was and a year of play. It's, it's then, and when you can have that play, it's like, then it's starting to sense in the body what what excites me. What what am I passionate about? What do I love doing? What, what do I wake up in the morning and get excited about? That's like, if you like the breadcrumbs or that's the signs pointing, pointing us where to go. And then if we're courageous enough to take them, um that's where joy comes from and that's where our energy starts to increase so i strongly encourage anybody it's really around listening to your heart and your gut and your body not the head because the head will tell us to do daft things or not do anything it'll say don't do that stay put you must be daft but you know you only have one life and to me success is around being happy and yeah. living a, a fulfilling life it, it's not around doing what we should or have to do or must do otherwise my dad will say x or i'll let everybody down if i and you can already hear my energy goes down when i say things like that it's like <laughs> la, 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 la. so you, there's all these cues that you may hear in other people but it's like starting to be aware of them in yourself so you can go oh hang on a minute i feel heavy when i talk about that but i feel really excited when i think about that you know yeah. <laughs> well it was during that time too that i hired uh, i probably worked with a, a couple different coaches and it was for different reasons. Um, you know, one coach uh, I was drawn to for, um, it was uh, more around some of my sports and athletics as well as leadership. And I had seen him and resonated in a certain way. And then another coach, again, I had been talking with her one-on-one -on -one, and then she was talking about just what you said, light versus heavy. How do you, how do you find those things? Uh, you know, for my life, so much of what I had done was through my head and not through my heart and my gut. And, um, so I really was in that mode of, well, I'm in this transition now. How do I figure out what's saying? And I think I was just looking, what's that next corporate thing? I was planning to just stay on the river. Um, and it wasn't until about three to four years later that I actually decided, no, I'm going to take a whole different, I'm going to take that left turn and, and go down a different path. So, so I'm so glad you're sharing that because I, I don't, I don't feel like my energy at the time, it was good at the beginning. And then it really, it went, it got, it got low, exactly. it got low, which is part of why I'm starting, did this podcast because I know how low it can get and how, uh -huh. how Properly. frustrating and yeah, it can be. And the other thing to share is people might be like, how the hell do I listen to my body? And, and in, a, in a modern day society, it's uh, really difficult because we've got so much noise going on. So if you think about 
um, and I was sharing this just yesterday, but if you think about life at the moment in the busyness of, you know, being Netflix and our phones and emails and conversations, and da, 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 it's noisy. It's like being in a concert. So how can you hear your internal tune if all you can hear is all the external blaring concert? So the, the thing is to, you know, in order to hear your tune and what song you want to sing, or what your vibration is, if you like. Maybe you want to be on the tambourine, you know, maybe you don't want to sing at all. You've got to pause somehow and give space to start to tune in to you and, and not listen to the voices of, of the parents or the universities or whatever. And how do you do that? Well, it's around taking some time, trying to find time, either in nature, doing some journaling, perhaps doing some meditation, or just going for a walk or going for a run, but just get some air time so you can breathe and, and start to tune into what, what your own melody is rather than the one that everyone else is playing for you. Yeah, that's exactly what I needed. I needed that alone time and yet I wasn't creating that for myself. I was busy. I was creating, yeah. I was, you know, <laughs> oh, I'm going to go play golf. I'm going to go play volleyball. Yeah. I'm enjoying this time, but I wasn't, um, exploring and discovering and it wasn't making time to do the journaling so that's the value of I think when I did get involved with a coach because those that was the homework right was you know def define certain things what are those things that give you energy and one of the things she had me do was the strengths finders uh, for leaders I'd already done the strengths finder tool she had me do strength finders for leaders and that brought up some other strengths that then she noticed about me and that really became very powerful about, oh, how do I step into that strength? Not what job do I want or how do I get a role? How do I look at that strength and how has that been showing up in my life? And how can I stay in that space? And it was, uh, it was yeah, it was pretty powerful. And if we're so busy, like going skiing or hiking or climbing, or, you know, you get home, you grab some tea and you go out and you're back and then you're into bed and then, duh, 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 and then back to work and blah, 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 blah. But it's not surprising you can't tell that you've, there's something else going on yeah because we just cover up our feelings or, or we you know we get home we have a beer and then we eat ice cream and then <clears> we don't we, we cover up any feelings by either eating and drinking or by by doing doing is just is actually discretion it's activity to stop us feeling and think feeling what we're actually what actually is going on yeah it takes courage to slow down it does it does in fact i'm looking at my calendar here and it has a little quote on it mm -hmm. and um the one i saw yesterday was very powerful it says i enjoy moments of silence and solitude i listen to my inner wisdom and i just went oh wait a minute what am i you know because i'm like oh i gotta go here i gotta do this here's what my calendar I just load my calendar for the day and i don't load my calendar for moments of silence and solitude <laughs> <laughs> to listen to my inner wisdom <laughs> and no, when i'm in my you. car I'm in a melody to a podcast, you know, or music or, you know, or I'm cooking. calling someone. Yeah. We're cooking. We're, we're, we've got a podcast on, you know, we're washing up. It's just, we have always input. Yeah. It's how do we create some no input? <laughs> yeah. Well, which is what I think COVID did for all of us. Right. So I think a lot of people had this influx of, Ooh, there is some solitude now. And you know, how do I spend quality time with my family and um, how do I not always be going and doing so? Well, Claire, I could talk to you all afternoon about this. This has been uh, so enjoyable, and I love hearing your story and how how you um, started your your path about listening to your body and in your life and this discovery. And then you kind of lost it. You got caught up in all of that, and then now you're back to that again. And you know, I can tell you're in such a great place. So, um, but we we do need to start to wrap up. So. Share, if you would, what you think has served you best when you look back on your career and your life. And maybe it's a strength or habit or discipline or personality trait. I, I think one thing that served me best, I've, I've been fortunate enough to be pretty optimistic and pretty, you know, enthusiastic. Uh, and it's it's it, using that and, and enjoying it and, and, and seeing it as, as the gift that it is and sharing that enthusiasm and passion is, uh, is what I do now. And so, but I think it served me even when I, you know, I was at school and at university, because I was always, I mean, when I was uh, at school and university, I remember thinking, I'm just going to enjoy every day as much as I can. 
And that's what I did. And yeah. I, st- like you pointed out, I stopped doing that. And it was only when I was having literally this conversation about the river and hanging a left. It's like, it's time to hang a left and have some fun and enjoy every day again. And then I was like, do you think I can do that as an adult? Can I, can I really enjoy every day? Oh, ooh, I don't know. We're supposed to be very serious as adults, aren't we? Yeah. No. It shouldn't life be hard and I need to be working <laughs> and contributing. My sister has to talk me off the ledge. I don't know how often I call her and she's like, uh, you know, she's like, you are living the dream. I want your life. And yet you keep coming in with, oh, should I get a job? Should I do this? Should I start another podcast? Should I, you know, there's all these doing things. And she's like, can't you just enjoy what you've created? And I'm like, oh, absolutely. You know, I've created something that allows me to meet exciting and beautiful, wonderful people at a really meaningful and deep level. And I get to tell stories and I get to celebrate and recognize people's life and career stories. How is that not amazing, right? <laughs> Why would I want to do anything else? So exactly, <laughs> exactly. Definitely. Okay, so it's your enthusiasm and optimism and energy. And now you're back to that. And I can definitely see that and feel that. So yeah. yeah. So any any words of wisdom that were impactful for you at one point in your life that might be uh, helpful for others? I think actually it's what I've already shared and um, is around the follow what you're passionate about or what you enjoy doing because then you'll get into it and that can be from uh, subject choices at school or university to jobs and careers because if you enjoy it and if you don't know then have a go and it doesn't matter if you fail but try something else or try just go and try things and then then you'll find ultimately like oh this I love and as soon as you kind of like get this enthusiasm and this body opening and excitement and expansion if you like almost like this expansion and curiosity your eyes go wide you're like oh my god what's this that's your flow state that's your your bliss and that's where to go because then you will do the work then you'll put the time in then your success will flow without too much effort because you'll be passionate and curious and put the put the work in because you love doing it so that I think that's the key Whatever you're choosing in life, choose what you love doing. And if you don't know, then go and have some fun finding out what you love doing. Yeah, I love that. Go have fun finding out. Um, I, I, at one point, was like trying to figure it out. And I remember I had a different coach that was like, you must have said figured it out in our lunch, which was only about an hour, you know, four, five, six times. She says, all this figuring has got to be exhausting. And I'm like, oh, my God, you're right. You know, how do you have fun discovering? And that's it should be fun. Yeah, an exploration absolutely. and yeah. Mm. Wow. Well, Claire, those are great words, I think, to to end on. So thank you so much for sharing your story today and and sharing your energy, optimism and enthusiasm. Oh, I think it's thank really going to be having, powerful. Thank you, Kathy. It's been a joy to, to see you again and to connect. And uh, yeah, it's it's been a lovely lovely way to spend an afternoon so thank you (laughs) well thank you for joining us and listeners if you enjoyed today's interview please subscribe below and then you'll be alerted as other interviews are published if you have any questions for me or for Clary Vaughn please post them on my website lifestorycurator.com and I'll make sure to forward them to her and make sure that they get answered and I guess on that note let's just everyone let's stay safe stay well and let's keep sharing those stories thank you